Greetings to you from the Phoenix, Arizona area. August 30th, 2017. And I'm going to share with you today some thoughts on the Lord's Supper. My name is Tony Denton. My website is a site for the Lord.com and I invite you to check it out and even you'll find the notes for this discussion on that website. So, I'd like to talk to you about it from the standpoint of a fulfilled prophecy believer. If you are not one who believes in fulfilled prophecy, fulfilled eschatology, otherwise called a full preterist, then you really don't have to listen to this because it won't make a lot of sense to you. You won't know the background of where I'm coming from with this. And so I ask you to maybe consider another topic that I have on my website. There are plenty of other ones that you can look into and consider and try to get a hold better of where I personally am coming from before listening to this. Okay? But if you are a full preterist, then I urge you to do indeed please consider my words today and do so as Berean-mindedly as possible. Open your mind and consider these thoughts, because I had to do that myself. All right. The Lord's Supper in relation to full preterist thinking. Let's first read Jesus and Paul on the Lord's Supper. Let's consider Jesus' words from Luke's account of the example in chapter 22, 15 through 18, then his account of Jesus' explanation in verses 19 and 20. Now, I don't have time to deal with it here, but yes, I'm convinced that the Lord's Supper wasn't only instituted during the Passover, but also, more importantly, that the purpose picture that Jesus was establishing for his disciples was his own personal extension or continuation of the Passover ceremony that would be more regularly observed, I believe weekly, by them in memory of him while he was away for the next 40 years, that is, a generation. So I see Luke's account like this. Verses 15 through 18 and verses 19 through 20 are concurrent, okay? Verses 19 and 20 can be laid over the top of 18 and 19 or vice versa. One is the example, the other is the explanation. Again, that's as much as I can get into it because this is going to be lengthy enough as it is. Now, to uh, Luke's account, chapter 22, 15 through 18 first, to his apostles Jesus said, I have greatly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I say to you that I will by no means again eat this until it's fulfilled in God's kingdom, or per verse 18, when God's kingdom arrives. Verse 17 goes on to say, and having taken the cup, having thanked, he said, you take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you that I will by no means again drink of the fruit of the vine until God's kingdom, or per Matthew's account, my father's kingdom, arrives. Now, verses 19 and 20, the explanation part of the example. Having taken a loaf, having thanked you broke, and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is being given on your behalf. Do this in my remembrance. And likewise, that is, after he drank just as he ate, in verses 15 and 20, Likewise of the cup, saying, This, the cup, is the new covenant in my blood, which is being poured out on your behalf, or that is, for the remission of sins, per Matthew's account. Okay? Now, from Luke's mentor, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, 23b through 32, let's read what he had to say. The Lord Jesus took a loaf, and having given the thanks, he broke, and he said, This is my body given on your behalf. Whenever you eat, that part I stuck in there, whenever you eat, do it in remembrance of me or my remembrance. Likewise, he took the cup, saying, this, the cup, is a new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink, do it in my remembrance. Whenever you eat the loaf and drink the cup, you reenact the Lord's death until he arrives. That's verse 26. Consequently, verse 27, whoever eats the loaf or drinks the cup of the Lord improperly will be guilty of the Lord's body and blood. So let a person approve himself after scrutiny and let him eat of the loaf and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment against himself if he doesn't fully consider the body. This is why many among you are weak and sickly and quite a few are sleeping. But if we were thoroughly considering ourselves, that is, the body of verse 27, 
we wouldn't be in a state of being thusly judged. However, being judged by the Lord means that we're being disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. There are several points that need to be considered from these passages and others, but a stage must first be set. Since this material is directed toward a preterist audience, full preterist at that, these are merely reminders of concepts we already agree upon that need to be kept in mind as we study today. Five things. Number one, the church of the first generation Christians was the betrothed bride of Christ. Number two, the apostles comprised a foundation, that is, the beginning portion of that bride. Number three, the marriage of Christ to his bride occurred around the time of the events of Judaism's AD 70 demise. Number four, the wedding was the time of the anointing of the most holy place, Daniel 9, 24 and 27. Therefore, number five, the wedding also accomplished Daniel's reconciliation for iniquity criteria via the remission of sin, chapter 9, verse 24 of Daniel. Okay, firstly, consider the importance of the aorist verbs eat and drink in Luke twenty two fifteen and 18. The aorist tense indicates a punctiliar action, that is, as opposed to a linear action. It's an act that transpires at a given point in time. Think of it in the past tense. I ate, I drank. By doing this, it becomes clear that this aorist tense refers to an action that occurred at some particular point in time. In other words, it was not an ongoing action. So, related to the account of this historical meal, Jesus spoke of something he would do at some punctiliar or aorist point in the future. In other words, corresponding perfectly to the whole Hebrew wedding motif with a son leaving his betrothed to build a home for her in his father's land, Jesus said that as he had just eaten and drunk something with her, he promised his betrothed that he would again eat and drink with her in his father's kingdom. Now, we can add to that that immediately following this is when Jesus went into the John 14 spiel about returning for her once all things were ready. Okay? Just coincidence? I don't think so. There's a connection. Jesus sets up the Lord's Supper, institutes it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and those accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke fit around the time of John 13. John just doesn't record it. You can look that up in parallel gospel account books and so on. And then Jesus goes on in two. The spiel about, I will return for you. Like the betrothed husband, the groom, is going to finish his work and then come back to retrieve his bride. Now, I doubt if any of my audience have doubts about there being a connection between the Lord's Supper and marriage betrothal. But just in case you do, all you have to do is do a search on the web to find gobs and gobs of information on it. That's not difficult. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing the tense of what Jesus said is twofold. Number one, to prepare you for something very significant I'll share in a few moments. And number two, to demonstrate that many seem to have never considered the possibility that Jesus was not talking about a continual eating and drinking of the supper with the children of the union he created in AD 70. In other words, just as there was the aorist eating and drinking in AD 30, so Jesus, by the word he chose, according to Luke and Paul, there was an aorist eating and drinking in AD 70. In other words, Jesus chose a word that referred to a one-time, punctiliar action in the future of eating and drinking with them again in the future, specifically to drinking. Okay, so those are important to remember that particular point. Secondly, consider the import of the aorist verb gave in Luke 22:19. We've often taught or I've heard that one of the aspects that was perfect in God's timing of all things coming to fruition had to do with the impressiveness of the Greek language in the first century. One of the things about Greek is that it tends to be very specific. There being five words for love is a case in point. You know, we have one love, one love. I love pizza, I love my wife, I love my dog, I love my car, and so on. In Greek, there are five words for love more specific than what we have in our language. Now, did you know that there are at least two different Greek verbs translated as gave? One of those is edidou, E-D-I-D-O-U, 
which is in the imperfect tense, meaning it refers to something ongoing to an action that extends over a period of time and or repeats itself, as is found in the case when Jesus was giving or handing out bread in Luke 9, 16, miracle of the loaves and fishes. So he didn't just give a big basket at one point in time to somebody else who then gave it out. But he actually, according to the word, sat there and handed it out over and over and over. Was giving, present tense, continual action that took place over an extended period of time. So they would come to Jesus, he would give out more bread. They'd come to Jesus, that he gave out more bread, and so on. So it's more than a single time giving. That's edidu. Now, the other one, the one chosen by the Spirit here in the case of the Lord's Supper, is edokane, E-D-I-K-E-N, which, like the words eat and drink, is in the aorist tense. Not the imperfect tense, the aorist tense, meaning it refers to a single, one-time giving or handing over. The point? Well, if it isn't clear already, this means that when to these members of the betrothed, Jesus gave the loaf, and the word arton means a loaf, not bread in general. He gave the loaf and the cup of the fruit of the vine, which incidentally is the more relevant emblem related to our study here. He passed each of those to one of them for them to share it among themselves, an action among the Hebrews that depicted a close fellowship. So picture him sitting in a circle. You have 12, 13 in a circle. Jesus picks up the cup. He gave thanks. He drank from it, he handed it to the next one, he said, do what I've done, and they pass it around. That was the Hebrew way. It pictured their oneness together as they drank from the cup or ate from a single loaf. So, that's very important to picture in your mind as we look at how that's connected to a full preterist view of observing the Lord's Supper. Okay, let's see if I can get back to where I was in my thinking here. Okay, yes, uh, just as he ate of the loaf, Jesus drank of the cup. I want to emphasize that. Some people have said that Jesus didn't partake, but I think it's very clear that he did partake of the loaf and the cup, for he said he would not drink again until in his Father's kingdom. And the same thing he said in reference to the bread. So he passed, that is, Edokane, Eris tense passing, so he passed each of those emblems to them, telling them to do this, that is, do what he had just done. Now, some will say that the do this command was only in reference to the keeping of the supper in general. But Jesus said it twice, once after he exemplified for them what to do with regard to each emblem. So that makes it sound more like he was describing how to do what was to be involved in the Lord's Supper. Not just saying do the Lord's Supper in general, but here's how you do or observe it. Now, even though the cup is what we'll need to focus on momentarily, notice also what we just discussed corresponds perfectly to the word the Spirit chose, the word broke. Again, if one compares Luke 9.16 with Luke 22.19, he can see that there are also at least two different Greek terms for that word. Kataklao in Luke 9, refers to the idea of breaking something down into pieces as Jesus did with the five loaves for a great multitude, which he continually passed out over an extended period of time. While Klao, in Luke 22, refers only to a one-time breaking or breaking off as one would break off a piece of a whole for himself. Concerning the cup, Matthew has Jesus commanding all of them to drink from it, while Mark said that they all drank from it. This means that just as Jesus exemplified the eating part of his supper meal by breaking off a piece to eat and passing it to them saying, do this, he also drank from the cup he took. Then passed it to them, Ed O'Kane, commanding them to do this, what he had just done. Drink from it, which is how they shared it, according to Luke twenty-two seventeen. All right, you're probably thinking, Tony, you're just going on about how it's to be done, like you're debating somebody in public, like I have done, in reference to the manner in which it is to be observed. But that's not my main point, but it has to be included, because it's very important on how this plays out. Okay, well, all of this that I've discussed here points to their cultural betrothal custom of one-on-one, man-to-woman, one party to another singular party. 
In this case, Jesus, one party, betrothing to himself the corporate body of his disciples, another party, who would, of course, add to that bride body over the next 40 years as they brought in members of the remnant, as we preterist folks understand. Okay, let's bring all of this information so far together by considering the actual custom, which will emphasize the significance of the cup that was introduced into this supper, something that was not actually in the original Passover. The cup was not in the original Passover, at least that we have anywhere in the Bible, but Jesus introduces this into the picture, and we want to know why. What's it about this cup? Why did he want to introduce this? Well, I never really had a good answer for that until I restudied this whole thing in relation to fulfilled eschatology, a betrothal marriage business of the Hebrew culture. When it came to betrothals and marriages among the Jews of Jesus' time, and even still now among some, they had the custom that the man and woman would each drink from a singular cup at two different times to picture the initiation and the consummation of the covenant made between them, that they were in agreement or unity concerning this pledge to one another. Now, upon their promise to one another at the time of the betrothal, they each drink from the cup of Arison, E-R-U-S-I-N. Then later, at the time of the wedding proper, they each drink again of another singular cup, the cup of Nisuin, N-I-S-U-I-N. Now, mind you, there wasn't and isn't one specific cup named Arison and one specific cup named Nisuin somewhere in Jerusalem that everybody used. The two parties involved, the groom and bride, two parties involved could use the exact same drinking vessel on both occasions if they wanted to, at one time at the betrothal and a year later at the wedding or whatever, and they probably often did. But at the betrothal, they called it Arison, while at the marriage they called it Nisuin because of what it depicted. They're initiating and they're consummating. The two parties drinking from the cup of Arison ceremonially represented their oneness and initiation, while the two parties drinking from the cup of Nisuin ceremonially represented their oneness and consummation. Now, once they drank from that second Nisuin cup, having thereby initiated and consummated their transition or transformation from being two separate people to becoming or being one person, then like the wedding ceremony, was a once-for-all-time event that pictured the forever fulfillment of their commitment to one another. In other words, they didn't continually week after week or month after month or year after year repeat the ceremony of their consummation. Just like the drinking of the Arison cup was a one-time picture of their commitment, so was the cup of Nisuin. It was a one-time partaking to express the picture of their consummation. So they didn't, later on in their marriage, keep doing that, keep drinking of that cup, and after they had kids, start bringing their kids into it. Once that union was made, it was made. Their children, who came from that union, didn't week after week, year after year, or whatever, constantly involve themselves in that ceremony, that repetition. That's all it would be, just be repetition, kind of like what a ritual is, right? So, the clear picture I see is groom Jesus betrothing bride church to himself during this institution of Lord's Supper, telling her that he, after he finished building and creating her, the church, like he promised in Matthew 16, 18, as an unblemished bride, he would then drink again with her, indicating not some literal drinking again, but the fulfillment of his promise to marry her upon the demise of the unfaithful old covenant wife, of course. So when Jerusalem was destroyed, Judaism was put down, the Jews were put down, the wife was thereby destroyed, the old covenant wife, then deity, Jesus was free to marry the new bride, the church, the everlasting bride. And drinking of the Arison cup implied their drinking of the Nisuin cup at the time of the wedding. So the wedding occurred. Jesus did what he said he was going to do. He came back for her and married her. Thus, the Nisuin cup was seen to have happened in a spiritual sense. See, just like we always say, the natural comes first and the spiritual. You got the physical fleshly things that create a picture And then that picture has been fulfilled. Arison did that. It was the fleshly picture of something. And then Nisuin was fulfilled spiritually. Now that leads us to, thirdly, considering the import of the word Jesus chose for new. 
Okay, so we've looked at the importance of the word for drink, the verb for drink being a one-time future, one-time drinking. The word for gave was a one-time giving that Jesus passed to them for them to drink and picture their oneness and so on. And then now, let's look at the word new. As with gave and broke earlier, there are at least two different Greek words for new. Neos refers to something new in time, something brand new that didn't exist before, while kainos refers to a neos that has essentially come into its own, something that has found itself, its goal, its purpose, something that through its life experiences or its molding by others has become its most beautiful or useful self. Again, neos is one word, kainos is the other. Neos is not the one that was used here, Kainos is the one that was used in reference to the Lord's Supper. Kainos is the fulfillment of the Neos. It's something that has already been in existence, but is now at its best self, or what its purpose was from the beginning. And we could say that it has discovered or reached the point of fulfillment, its consummation. So we could look at Kainos as being the consummation of Neos, the initiation. Now with that in mind, we can look at Arison as being the neos, the cup of Arison being neos, the initiation of something, and Nisuin, the cup of Nisuin, as being the kainos, the consummation of that earlier something. So, being a well-established custom, the literal drinking of the cup of Arison, the neos, represented and foreshadowed its end, kainos, the wedding of the lamb and his betrothed. There didn't need to be a literal drinking of the cup of Nisuin at AD 70. For that which was real, spiritual, and eternal, that which the cup of Arison foreshadowed, had come. Now, by the way, the same kainos, Greek word, is the one found in the phrase, the new covenant. So when Jesus talked about he would drink of this cup, he would drink it new with him in the kingdom. That's the word kainos we've been talking about. But that same word is used also in the phrase, the new covenant. The word new in the new covenant phrase never comes from neos. It's always from kainos as well. See, just as the kingdom actually existed since the arrival of Adam, when we might say it was a neos kingdom, and then found its consummation, its kainos, with the arrival of Jesus, the second last Adam, so the covenant existed since the arrival of Adam, Hosea 6, 7, and then found its consummation with the arrival of Jesus, Romans 5:14. In other words, the old covenant wasn't a completely separate covenant all its own from the new covenant. But the new covenant is the goal, purpose, and fulfillment of the old covenant. Just like the cup of Nisalin was a fulfillment of the cup of Arison, and Kainos is a fulfillment of Neos, the new covenant is a fulfillment of the old covenant. The new kingdom of Christ is a fulfillment of the kingdom that began with the first Adam. So, When Jesus said in Luke 22 that the cup of the fruit of the vine was his new covenant in his blood, the idea was simply that his sacrifice and shed blood was what ratified the perfect eternal covenant that was always in the mind of God as the finished product of all his work. Just as a cup is of no use without a drink element, and a drink element is of no use without a cup, so the new covenant has no value without the shed blood of Jesus, and Jesus' shed blood has no value without the new covenant. That's why Jesus chose a single cup with a single volume of drink in it, because it pictured their inseparability, their inextricability. You can't separate them, but if you do, you destroy a picture. And this covenant was and is the eternal marriage covenant between Christ and his bride, which in turn made it possible for the kingdom to then find its fulfillment. Check out Ephesians 1.10. All things have become kainos. Revelation 21, verse 5. Another thing that made all of this new is that in this consummated kingdom and eternal covenant, there would be, as Jesus said, the remission of sins, the fulfillment of the old annual rolling forward of sins. In other words, the type, that is the neos, found its antitype, its kainos, in the reconciliation of iniquity within the true most holy place, the finished kingdom of God, Christ, and heaven. Whatever blemishes were found in the faithful till death saints at the Lord's coming were for them washed away, and his righteousness was imputed to them, Galatians 5.5, 5, fulfilling as well Daniel's prophecy of perfect righteousness being shed abroad 
in chapter 9, verse 24. Fourthly, the next obvious term to consider from Luke's and Paul's accounts of the institution of the Lord's Supper is the phrase, until he arrive. We've got to deal with that one. We've dealt with a lot of other words. A lot of other words are very important. But this is the one that keeps coming up when we discuss the Lord's Supper, the until he arrives part of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's pretty well established among us full preterists that the fulfilled in the kingdom phrase and the when the kingdom arrives phrase are equivalent in event to the coming of Christ phrase. They're all the same thing. The fulfilled in the kingdom, the arrival of the kingdom, coming of Christ, they're simultaneous events. Jesus said to some folks in Matthew 16, 28, that not all of those in his audience, that they would be dead when he arrived in and with the kingdom. So since we discussed how that Jesus fulfilled his promise to come back for his betrothed and marry her, which transpired around the time of the events of AD 70, demise of the old covenant wife, see Matthew 22, verse 7, then when Paul wrote to the Corinthian Christians about how in their observance of the Lord's Supper, they essentially reenact the Lord's death till he arrives, it shouldn't be difficult to understand and accept that he anticipated the cessation of its observance upon the fulfillment of what it pictured, namely, that which the Lord died in order to start bringing to fruition. As we said often, the death of Christ was the beginning of the end, not the end itself, the end being a cross-determined end, a payback or vengeance for the death of Christ. Incidentally, when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he was talking about all he could do in his earthly work. For we find another, it's finished statement in Revelation 21 verse 6 by his father, Yahweh, after Jesus the Son concluded his heavenly work and brought fully achieved salvation to mankind, Revelation 11 15. The thing is this, especially after all that we've discussed so far in this lesson, there's now no reason to try so hard to work around the normal meaning of the word until. With all that we've discussed so far being what was in the mind of the first generation Christians, I seriously doubt that it ever crossed their minds that Paul didn't mean the usual casual until. I'm not saying at all that Paul was even indirectly indicating that they could not continue observing it if they so desired as long as they, especially in view of Hebrews 9, 9 and 10, Romans 14 and 17, didn't bind this earthly ritual upon post-fulfillment Christians as if they'd otherwise commit a cardinal sin and be bound for eternal death or hell or whatever if they didn't observe it. Now, I'm merely saying, especially since the supper accounts taken together connect the concept of fulfillment with the idea of until that there's more to indicate that until means until in the usual fashion than it doesn't mean what it normally means, okay? If you're talking about a fulfillment of something, like Jesus said, I'll drink this when it's fulfilled in the kingdom, and then Paul says until he arrives, I mean, it just seems logical that until means until in that particular case for sure. In other words, after the arrival of their Lord, they really could cease from their observance of this ceremony with impunity. Why? Because the supper was a memorial for while he was away finishing up his heavenly work. So he had finished his earthly work, and then for the next 40 years of our time, he was doing heavenly work, high priestly work and all that. So while he was away, he gave them the supper as one of the things that they could do to help them get through their time. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Then, when he arrived for the wedding at the end of that 40 years, and by the way, the Greek word here is erkomai, the word for arrival, not parousia, the word for presence. That last Arish drink of the cup of Nisuin was fulfilled, not to be drank again, especially not with the children from the union just created. Again, not saying it was wrong to do it. That just wasn't the expectation. That wasn't the point. Because after the arrival of Jesus and then his resultant presence, he would be present. So the picture is that if we continue observing it, it's sort of like picturing that we don't believe he's present yet, which brings up the concept of Colossians 2, 16 and 17. You know, we've used Colossians 2, 16 and 17 against the Sabbatarians, or a lot of us have, to say, look, do you believe Jesus came? Oh, of course he came. You know, he was born and he lived and all of this and did what he was expected to do by his father. 
And then we'll say, okay, but you're, you're kind of implying by keeping a Sabbath that he hasn't come yet. We use that. We talk about that at length. Well, that's kind of what we're doing with the Lord's Supper. We're kind of indicating to people who have an understanding of it, which in our day and time in Western civilization, hardly anybody would understand it that way. But we're indicating anyway that we don't believe Jesus has come, that he hasn't fulfilled what he said he's going to fulfill. And he hasn't drunk of that wedding cup yet with his bride. Anyway, I'll just leave it that part of there for you to think about. Just as with the subject of baptism, in another talk that I have on YouTube and notes I have on my website and so on, just as the subject of baptism and its direct connection to suffering and even martyrdom, something else very significant needs to be considered here. The Lord's Supper was something observed often during the transition between the time of his ascension and his return because it had to do with the time of waiting and purification for the betrothed bride, the church. See, by their regularly recalling to memory the mortifying death of their Lord, their groom, it served the church to be a constant reminder of not only the minuteness of their suffering, but also the purpose of it. In other words, it was to purify them as the Lord's bride. So the bride was going through a time of purification. So it reminded them, look, we are the betrothed of the Lord. The Lord has suffered and he has died for us. And so what we're going through is nothing compared to that, yet we have to go through it if we want to live with him as his bride, as his wife forever. In the very context of Paul's Lord's Supper paragraph, 1 Corinthians 11, he began it by saying that there must of necessity be divisions among you. Go back and check that out. It fits right in. Verse 17, or verse 17, 18, 19, somewhere in there, he says there must be divisions among you. Why? In order that those who are approved may be recognized. Verse, yeah, it is verse 19. See, it has to do with a purification. Who's going to stick with the bride and who's not? Who's going to apostatize and who isn't? Who's a true brother and who is not a true brother? Paul talked about false brethren in Galatians. Then in 1 Corinthians 11, after Paul mentioned divisions among them, so that those who approved could be recognized, then he went on to discuss how that there were those in the church being, present tense, being judged. Not going to be judged, so they were being judged, making them weak and sickly, even leading to the point of actual death. No, I don't believe during this time of the supernatural, check out Acts 5, 1 and following, that Paul was speaking spiritually here about weakness and sickness and death. In fact, it makes no logical sense at all to me that God would make his children spiritually weak, spiritually sick, and spiritually dead. That was the exact opposite of what he was trying to do. So those in the body, corporate body, who were weak and sickly and even had died, is because of their improper look at the body. That's what the context is all talking about. Read it again. We read it at the beginning. Check it out. It's how they viewed things. They weren't seeing what they were supposed to see. They weren't recognizing what they were supposed to recognize about who the body was and what was happening and why it was happening and wouldn't accept it or whatever the case was. And so the weak and the sickly and so on were examples. Like in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Examples to the body. Our first generation brethren... Those who, as Jesus' wife, became our mother, suffered and suffered much. With the apostles like Paul taking the brunt of it. Why? Because she, as the betrothed, was fulfilling the picture of the purification period of Hebrew women. Again, picture fulfillment, picture fulfillment, picture fulfillment. And on it goes with the spiritual eternal being, the finished product. Not more or continued picturesque ceremonies, rituals, and rites. And to say that the Lord's Supper is the fulfillment of the Passover goes against what we teach in every other situation. In other words, that types aren't shadows of more types. That rituals aren't fulfillment of more rituals. That physical signs always find their fulfillment in spiritual realities. That's what we teach. First the natural, then the spiritual. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. So to say that one physical ritual... It's a fulfillment of another physical ritual 
completely goes against the norm of what we teach and believe. So it's an inconsistency. Now, as I deal with in my baptism study, that other one of the two sacraments of the church, Jesus came to rid us of ceremonies, rituals, and rites, not to continue them or create new ones. Take your mind back to Colossians 2, 16, 17. Anyway, like Paul as an individual, so the bride church was filling up the sufferings of her groom, Colossians 1, 24. So the supper gave them encouragement in the realization that the very thing they were memorializing, namely the death of their Lord and groom, would be avenged simultaneously demonstrating to all who were in actuality his truly accepted people by liberating them. So Jesus came and liberated them, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 4 through 10. Liberated them from the persecution because they had been purified enough, especially since he at that time would then go ahead and impute his righteousness to them after they proved themselves for a generation. Well, let's consider one last point, and then we'll quit here, because it's longer than my normal talks. Usually I go like 35 minutes, but there was just too much information that had to be dealt with in this. So one more point, and we'll be finished. Consider the Lord's Supper in relation to the wilderness bread and water as it's related to the Passover. Now, I know many of, or most of us have resisted the idea of the words of Jesus in John chapter 6 to have anything at all to do with the Lord's Supper. But stick with me for a moment or two. Let's summarize some points made in John chapter 6, 27 through 58. When some folks seeking free food found Jesus, verses 23 to 26, he said to his audience that day to not be more concerned with food that perishes than for food that provides eternal life, verse 27. Still thinking about that miracle of loaves and hoping for another one, they brought up the miraculous manna of Moses in the wilderness, verse 31. Jesus then essentially told them that Moses was only providing a picture of the real thing because the real thing provides eternal life, verses 32 and 33. Then, where was I? Verse 31, 32 and 33. When they, like the Samaritan woman who wanted to drink of the water that provides eternal life, asked for that eternal life manna, verse 34, Jesus told them that he was that food. He was that manna. Moses, what he did and what he gave you was just a picture. I'm the real thing. After some disputation among them, Jesus repeated that he is the food or the bread of life, verse 48, and that their forefathers, even though they ate of that miraculous manna of Moses, died, verse 49. But if they'd eat the true bread, the antitype of Moses' manna, they'd live forever. And the true bread Jesus would give for that life would be his flesh, verse 51. And, just as one usually has something to drink with his food, that flesh would, of course, include his blood. For he went on to say that, unless they ate his flesh and drank his blood, they couldn't come into possession of that gift that would be provided on the last day when they were raised to that life. Verses 52 through 58. Now, besides the fact that we must admit that we can very easily see how a person would connect this conversation in John 6 with the Lord's Supper, at least in an indirect manner, let's consider Paul. In which 1 Corinthians chapter did Paul deal with the Lord's Supper? Chapter 11? Yes, but not only in chapter 11. He started to touch on it in chapter 10, and not only in verses 16 through 17. In chapter 10, 1 through 6, Paul brought up the idea of that other sacrament of baptism in verses 1 and 2 about their being baptized in relation to Moses as well as both the manna and the water in verses 3 and 4. Okay? Both things are pictured. The baptism concept and the Lord's Supper concept. So you have the manna and the water and also baptism. And what did he say about them? He said they were all, undoubtedly unknowingly among them, eating and drinking of something spiritual, namely Christ. That's what he said. They were eating of something spiritual. Would they think you were nuts if you told them that? Oh, no, I ate a piece of manna and I had some water. No, it was a picture of some picture of Christ. But because they, somewhat like those who came to Jesus in John 6 for free food, were focused on fulfilling their physical appetites more than their spiritual ones in relation to their God Yahweh. Nearly all except a generation of 20 years old and under, died in the wilderness, not getting to inherit the promised land that, by the way, typified the inheritance of everlasting life and the eternal kingdom. 
Now from there, Paul glided right on into introducing the topic of the Lord's Supper in chapter 10, which he would then deal with more at length in chapter 11. So it wasn't merely a coincidence that what Jesus talked about in John 6 mirrored what he talked about when he instituted the Lord's Supper. Was it merely a coincidence that just before writing about the Lord's Supper, Paul, as Jesus did, led into it with the whole manna incident? Was it merely a coincidence that the manna and water, as well as the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, pointed toward the body and blood of Christ? And was it merely a coincidence that the manna and water ceased upon their entrance into the promised land after 40 years of wilderness wandering? Especially since it seems to correspond so well to Paul mentioning in his discussion of the Lord's Supper in the following chapter the idea of their observing it until the Lord's coming, when he'd of course bring them their salvation of eternal life. This seems like a hard coincidence pill for me to swallow with all those questions. What about you? Think about all that. That's just kind of a side point. But it supports what I've already said. That's the point. What I've already gone through for the last 40 minutes is very powerful stuff. And this just backs it up. Falls right into it. Something else that's cool here is that just as there was the cup of Arison at the beginning of the 40-year transition and the cup of Nisuin at the end of it, there was a specified drinking of water from the rock at the beginning of the wilderness wandering and one at the end of it. Hmm, just a thought. So, let me end by saying this. Most of those who continue to observe the Lord's Supper today don't even observe it the way Jesus instituted it. So even though they may think it's an admirable thing or that it should be bound on folks, else they commit a cardinal sin, they've destroyed the picture of betrothal and what it all signified by observing it incorrectly, improperly. So, if we're going to observe it, I encourage it to be observed the way it was instituted. We observed it for many, many years after we became believers and fulfilled eschatology. And if we're in places where they're observing it, we observe it with them. There's no problem. We just decided we're not going to bind it on folks. So, even though we observe it, we're not going to bind it. And rather, we're celebrating what has already occurred through the observance of the Supper. The only issue that crosses our mind is that we want to be sure that nobody thinks that we are trying to picture something that has not occurred. So we emphasize the celebration of what Jesus has done and finished. Thank you for being with me this long. Uh, I knew it was going to be longer, and I apologize for that, but it's just too much information as you can tell. You might want to go get the PDF if you haven't already, and go through it again in written form so you can sort of absorb a lot of the stuff that was said because I've already been told that it's a little rigorous to go through and to get everything on the first go over. So again, thank you for your time and be sure to check out the website of cyphertolord.com and let me hear from you. Thank you.